welcome back everyone. It's good to have you here. So everyone seemed to like the random Q&A video from last Sunday. So like I said, I'll keep doing these when I'm home on the weekend and I'm able to record them. Or if I'm out and I'm able to find a place to upload a video from the moving of one place to another. So I had a bunch of questions from last week and I'm gonna answer a few of the top ones. And then I'm also gonna talk about what I see to be the biggest misconception or myth about photography. You could say it's all kinds of photography, but I'm just gonna go into it for landscape and outdoor photography in general. So I'll do that about halfway through and then I'll answer some more questions. So right now it is pretty early on Sunday morning. I have a 15 mile trail run today and I found that to be a really good way to stay in shape in the off season is to train for ultra mountain marathons, meaning 30 plus miles, you could say 33 plus miles in the mountains. And there's a really good training schedule for that that doesn't feel like overwhelm, but it definitely ramps you up to running really long miles. And I got my girlfriend into it last year and she never ran. And now she runs 20, 25 mile days without a problem. So if you guys want to get in really good trail shape, I will leave a link below this video with the book that I use for training. And it's just a fantastic book for endurance training in general, which also works for backpacking, day hiking, or anything else. And it's not sprinting, and it's not something you need to be in great shape to do. You can slowly work your way into it with this training method. So I'll leave that for you guys below. It's something that's changed my life as far as endurance. I don't find it to be a problem to hike 30 mile days anymore, or to go out and do a 30 mile run in the woods. It's more fun now, because I'm not feeling like I'm tired or hurting the whole time. But that's another tangent we can go into later if you guys are interested. So the first question that I got from a lot of people that people seem to be very worried about the last video where my camera strap was flapping all over the place in the wind. And I was surprised to see that comment from so many people, um, which is reasonable if you think about it. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to take you guys through a problem solving methodology that you could use for anything in life. And I'm going to show you how to kind of debunk the myth of the camera strap flapping using the methods that we would use to solve engineering problems when building jumbo jets. So I know when a lot of people hear aerospace engineering, they flinch and they're like, that's gonna be over my head. But when you're talking about really good engineering and people's ability to solve problems, my ability to explain it to you as a lay person shouldn't be complicated or complex. Usually the really complex things are all the mathematics that underlie it. But let me explain the problem solving methodology because anybody can use it. It's common sense. It's not for these super smart people or whatever. A lot of this stuff can be broken down to common sense. So I don't care that the camera straps flapping. And let me tell you why. Let's pretend this is one of my old tripods, but let's pretend this camera and we'll pretend there's a lens on it. It's my old D810. Let's pretend it's on my tripod. We'll just sit it right here, right? Now, let's pretend that this is obviously sitting in the wind. So if you watched my last video, wind was coming in from the side, hitting my camera strap and it was flapping all over the place. So from a perspective of design, you have this camera strap flapping all over the place and that's the only reason you don't want that is because you don't want the camera to shake and making your images out of focus, right? But if you think about this, you have this camera strap catching the wind and you see it moving all over the place, but things you don't see are the wind hitting the whole side of the tripod, hitting the side of the camera and hitting the side of the lens. So what's actually happening is the force of the wind is acting on all of this but this stuff's heavy, so you only see the camera strap moving. So when we're designing airplanes to fly, you're dealing with lift and drag, and that's essentially where the wind or any other force is hitting the airplane. So you have wind hitting this camera strap, you also hit it, have it hitting the sides, the tripod, and the camera. Now, when I'm looking at the camera strap, people are telling me to get these special straps that you can clip on and off, which is fine if they wanna use those. The reason that I don't think that that matters and I don't care about having a camera strap on is because even if I take this camera strap off, the surface area of the area where the wind could hit the camera and if there's a lens on here and the tripod 
is way bigger than this strap. So it would be like if you were walking in to a really windy day and the wind was blowing directly at you. If you walk like this with your hands in front of you at the wind, you're gonna feel the wind pushing you back, right? If you put your hands out to the side in the wind stream, you'll feel a little bit more of the wind pushing you back, but it's not gonna make a big difference. I consider my body like the camera, the tripod and the lens, and then the arms that I'm putting out to the side, that's like the strap. So removing the strap doesn't do anything for you as far as getting sharper images if you're just removing the strap and hoping that's gonna solve the problem. So what you really need to do if you're shooting in heavy wind is you need to realize that there's a lot more things that are catching that wind. You just don't see the wind hitting them because they're not moving around all the way because they're heavy like the camera, the lens, and the tripod. So that vibration that hits these from the wind is still gonna cause your images to be out of focus. So you need to have a different technique that doesn't just assume the camera strap's gonna solve the problem because the camera strap's not really making a whole lot of difference. It might add a little bit of difference. So here's what I do. The number one thing, when you're shooting in heavy wind, and as you'll notice in that video that people commented on, wait till the wind dies for a little bit, and when it dies, that's when you wanna fire your shot off. So when you see your strap flapping around, don't take the shot when it's flapping around. It's a good way to see how much your camera's actually moving. So that's why I don't tuck it back, because if the strap's really moving at all, I'm not gonna take the shot anyway. So this is like, what I use to see how much wind is actually blowing because that same wind is gonna hit my tripod, my camera and my lens, and it's still gonna make the image out of focus and I can't get away with that. So this is what I use to see how much the wind's blowing. When this stops, I fire the shot off. After I fire the shot off, I always check the focus up and down the entire center line of the image. And even if I think I have sharp focus in the shot, if it's a windy day, even if I'm waiting till the wind dies to fire the shot off, I'm still gonna take four or five exposures of the exact same composition because I know that even if I check my centerline focus, there's a good chance that part of that image might be out of focus. But if I take four or five or six of those shots, most likely one of those, if I'm waiting for the wind to die, will still work out really well. So you can take your straps off all you want, but the wind is still hitting everything else that's affecting the shake of the camera, and that's what makes your images out of focus. So the next thing you can do is you can change your shutter speed. So I always like to shoot at a much faster shutter speed if the wind's blowing. A good rule of thumb for shutter speed is one over your focal length. So if you're shooting at 50 millimeters, shoot at 1 50th of a second shutter speed. And that rule of thumb comes from handheld shooting, meaning you can get a sharp handheld image approximately with one over the focal length. That's why you could shoot a 14 millimeter at a lot longer shutter speed than like a 500 millimeter because one over 14th of a second is a lot longer than one over 500th of a second. So that works for handheld. So it should work for wind too. It always does for me if you wait for the wind to die. So the big problem with thinking that the camera strap is gonna solve the problem is that you get this device now that you can take off your camera strap. Everybody recommended this exact same device, which the device is probably great. It also could have really good marketing, but the device isn't gonna solve your problem. It's just going to trick you into thinking that it's gonna solve your problem. And then you're gonna be like, well, I took my camera strap off, so my images should be sharp now. But really what you need is a system that looks at the entire complex system of why your images are out of focus or blurry because of camera shake. And you need to address that. You can't just address one small piece of that system. If a bunch of people are doing something or saying something like they did under that video, it always makes me question, well, maybe they could be right. That's 100% a possibility. But there's also a group think dynamic that if one person tells you something, instead of looking into why that thing's occurring or what actually could be causing it, they just take what somebody else told them on the internet and they run with it. And this is what really good marketing does. So if this camera strap company marketed that you could unclip their strap and it would solve the camera shake issue, that's probably really good marketing because it gets people to buy their strap instead of this really crappy strap. Another thing you can do, which I have on my, let's 
sounded nice. What I have on my new camera, uh, the Z7, which I'm shooting with right now. I just use this little bit of really thin cord. This is just really thin Dyneema cord. I just use that for my strap now because it saves weight. This is not very heavy. I don't care that it blows in the wind that much, but as far as a strap, you can tie anything on there. Even a shoelace or something would work if you want to save weight. And I just do that because I like to backpack and cut every ounce off of my pack possible. I also don't like to have straps that have clips on them because if one of those clips breaks, then your strap's out. But if this breaks, I'll just retie it on there. So things with many failure points are never good. Oh yeah, if somebody wants this D810, I'm not gonna use it anymore. I'll sell it to you for 500 bucks. It's probably about halfway through its life. It's got crack up here on the screen. The eyepiece works, but it's got duct tape on there. It does have a really right stuff L bracket and it's a great camera, it works really well. The whole back screen's in perfect shape. 500 bucks, I think it was like 3,000 bucks to start with. So if you want a nice full frame camera, I just don't want to go on Craigslist or something and sell it. So if you want it, email me, um, Dave at Dave Mara Photography. I'll ship it to you right away. 500 bucks plus shipping, which will be like 40 bucks. Um, if somebody wants a D810, it is beat up, I'll tell you that, but works great. All right, so enough of my rant on camera straps. I think you guys get the point there. Always analyze everything as false until you can prove it's true. That's my method at least. That doesn't mean I don't trust people. I trust people at the surface level. And then the more and more that they give me good information that I can test and prove true, I trust them more and more, but I always test. All right, let's see what we got here. The next question, I have a bunch of these. Oh yeah, I wanted to see which one I want to answer next. What are your thoughts on third party editing panels? Do you risk not learning, understanding the editing process for speedy, better results? In the early stages of our editing careers, do you use apps like PhotoPills, Google Earth, or similar to help plan your trips? It's a pleasure to watch your videos. This is from Johnny B. Thanks, Johnny B. I appreciate it, man. Uh, good questions. Okay. Editing panels. This is stuff like TK Actions or any other panel you use in Photoshop that can do things for you with the click of the button that usually takes multiple steps by hand. I'm not against editing panels in any way. I think it's great that people create them because they help a lot of people. My biggest beef with editing panels is that you guys know how software works, right? Every time you wait six months, there's a new camera or there's a new computer out because if there's not, those companies go bankrupt. So they'll make small improvements, sure. But a lot of times those improvements aren't worth you purchasing the brand new thing. So my problem with editing panels is not the money part because they don't cost that much. But every time that they want to make upgrades to these editing panels. They try to change where everything is. They try to improve it so much so it feels like it has more perceived value, which sometimes it does. But the problem is every year you have to relearn these editing panels a lot of times because they'll shift around where they located things. They'll add new tools. So if you think about it, when you're editing photos, you're changing the color value of a pixel or the lightness value of a pixel. So black to white, or the hue of the pixel around the outside of the RGB color wheel. That's all you're changing. So I'm a big fan of using luminosity masks. I have my own actions that just create one set of luminosity channels every time that I can work off of, but I don't use third-party editing panels because I wanna spend my time working on things that actually improve my photos instead of learning about new panels every time, which generally don't add very much to the actual quality of my image. So it's almost like a trap, right? Because you would think that they could be very helpful, but using luminosity channels in Photoshop, understanding how to edit raw files, and then using Photoshop hand-painted mask along with luminosity mask and some targeted adjustments, I can do everything that I would ever want to because I'm only editing and changing the color of a pixel or its lightness value, no more, no less. So you don't need that many tools. The hard part is, is to edit an image and accentuate the right color values and the right light saturation values in the right spots of the image so it looks nice. So what I always suggest to everybody is learn how to use luminosity mask, absolutely. But learn how to create them for yourself. And once you create them for yourself, you can make an action that'll just create all the luminosity channels every time. And that's what you can create the masks from. 
So I don't think you need all these extra panels. I think we all need just better and better understandings of how Photoshop works. And by better understanding, I don't mean understanding all the tools in the program. I mean understanding what's actually happening when you make the adjustment. So when you make a levels adjustment, what is it actually doing to each pixel? Well, it's just brightening or darkening each pixel, no more, no less. When you make a saturation adjustment, all it's doing is changing the color and the lightness value of each pixel. So understanding the first principles of things. First principles is how I got to the camera and the strap falsity. First principles just means the actual things that run the universe, the first ground level principles that make everything work. And physicists use this stuff all the time when they're trying to figure out how the world works. But first principles are what will lead you to solve problems without having to ask somebody how to follow a step-by-step -step process to get where you're trying to go. You can instead use first principles and say, well, I'm trying to get here. I understand how the system works. Let me design my own path to get here because by understanding the system, I don't need to ask somebody else for the path. I might brainstorm using their ideas for specific ideas along that path, but I'll design my own path and get there because I'll understand things a lot more. Um, as far as apps like PhotoPills, Google Earth, I don't use PhotoPills except to get the angle that the sun's going to be at before my trip. Other than that, I don't care because spending a lot of time out in the wilderness and camping a lot of days and having a base camp, you get to study how the light moves over the landscape. And that's going to give you a lot better idea and a lot better shots than using photo pills. I'm not opposed to it. I just don't ever use it. I use Google Earth and I use Gaia GPS to plan my trips. And I use a few other weather apps. And I'm creating a whole course right now inside my landscape photography school that deals with planning and it deals with my step-by-step -step process for prepping for a trip planning the shoots, using all the different tools that I use, going out on the trip, navigating on the trip, coming back from the trip. So it'll document that whole thing. Um, but I keep it pretty simple, but I do have a very step-by-step -step planning process that makes sure I'm ready for each trip when I go. So thanks for the question, Johnny. Um, what else do we got here? What is that lightweight looking tent you have? So this was from the last video. Uh, this tent I have, somebody else commented that it looked huge and I should get a smaller tent. Um, so it seems to be that there's opposition here. Now, it does look like a big tent. I'm just teasing you, dude. The other person that commented that. Um, it looks like a big tent. This is the Z-Pax duplex tent. It's made out of Dyneema material, which is, of course, made out of petroleum. But it's super lightweight, 100% waterproof, and it doesn't have poles. So you gotta use trekking poles. So on both sides of it to set it up, you use trekking poles. It weighs one pound, I think two ounces or something like that. Packs down extremely small. Here's a D810. There's the tent. Not bad at all. Um, I love this tent. The nice thing is, and this is what somebody else commented, why don't you get a smaller tent? Because when you're out in really nasty weather, such as monsoon, snowstorms, rain, and you have your camera gear and your backpacking gear, you need to have the ability to keep it inside of your tent because otherwise, if you're in a really bad storm, it will get wet no matter what you do. You can pull the side flaps down, do anything else, and it will get wet. So the reason to have a two-person tent and a lightweight tent is number one, lightweight is better if it's just as good as far as strength. But having a two-person tent gives you the ability to fully sit up. I can fully sit up in this tent. And I've spent three days in this tent before without leaving it, besides to go to the bathroom when there's breaks in the snow and rain. Um, and it just gives you more room so you don't go insane. In a one-man tent, it is very hard to not go insane sitting in it for three days. Plus, this just gives you room to change. It gives you room to read, sit up. You can stretch out, do everything else. So I love this tent. It's the Z-Pax Duplex. The only downside of it, is that it's like 700 bucks. Um, now you can get poles that make it freestanding without these extra poles. It's not freestanding with these poles, but you can get like a skeleton that goes over it to make it freestanding, which I find helpful for like Utah or anything you're on really hard rock surfaces and you have to camp. Because without freestanding, you have to put these down, set the tent up over it, and then put rocks down on the stakes. And if the stakes come out, the tent falls over. So you have to make sure that they're really well placed. 
but I love this tent. It's awesome. I'll clean that up later. Um, here's another question. How do you pack and protect your photography gear in your rucksack? Just a small f-stop ICU. Just zips open. I only have two lenses and one camera body and my GoPro. So it has a few little containers, keep batteries, lens. I have a microphone on there. Camera body here. Just zips up, throw it in my backpack. I also recommend don't use like, I don't recommend using photography backpacks. They're horrible. They're not well designed. They're heavy. They break easily. I use Hyperlite Mountain Gear backpacks. They're made out of that Dyneema material that the tent's made out of. You can beat the crap out of them. They're tough, they're water, they're pretty, they're not waterproof, you can't submerge it like a dry bag, but you can pack craft with it, it keeps your stuff dry. Um, so I just keep it inside there. And then when it rains, I will still use one of these Dyneema stuff stacks. Dyneema is just the material like the tent, it's waterproof. And I'll put the F-stop ICU in here inside my bag. And I just use those stuff sacks for clothes and everything else. You always want layers of protection inside your bag, even if it's waterproof. Um, so here's another question. Do you get frustrated when you get, when you've put in the effort to be at the right spot in the right time, in the right conditions, but the light, wind just aren't right? If so, how do you zen out? Great videos. Cheers for the work. All right. That's a really good question. This is from Sam Williams. Thanks, Sam. I appreciate it. Um, I like the process of creating images. I don't, if I get a great image, that's like the icing on the cake. I like the trip planning. I like the physical and mental challenge of being out there backpacking and finding spots that I've never seen before photographed and then waiting there to get a good shot there. So if I don't get a good shot, I see it as a planning trip where I got more information about the location. So next time I come back, if it was a good spot, I can have more knowledge about it and I can shoot it right next time. So just the process and the complexity and the ability to constantly push yourself and get better, this is for me at least, is what I really like about landscape photography and backpacking. And I don't really find myself needing to zen out. Um, I'm not somebody that takes my emotions too seriously. If I feel like crap one day in my mind, then I feel like crap in my mind. That's just something I notice. If I feel good one day, I'm like, okay, I feel good today. It is what it is. I don't really have control over what thoughts arise in my mind. I don't believe in free will. This is something we can get it down a rabbit hole on another day, but I do meditate every day. That's extremely helpful. Uh, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes at night. And that just helps me to detach from thoughts and be like, okay, that's just a thought, whatever. If you feel like crap, whatever, just keep going. So I don't let my emotions dictate what I'm up to. If I'm having a bad day mentally, then I just keep cranking out the same work that I would anyway, because I know at that end of the day, if I don't crank out that work, then I'll feel even worse. But if I get the work done, there's a chance that I will feel a little bit better. And I'm not a psychologist by any means. So don't listen to me and expect this to work for yourself. Uh, this is just what works for me and I've found to work well over time. So if I feel great after a shoot because I got a good shot, then I'm pumped about it, sure. Um, but if I feel bad, I don't really feel bad because I didn't get the shot because it wasn't my fault. So I just do every step possible to always set myself up for what I'm trying to accomplish. And if I did that and I still don't accomplish what I was trying, then I come back and try again another time. And I think that framework of knowing that you'll fail a whole lot and knowing that's the only way to succeed because you're constantly failing. And when you fail, you get feedback into the system. And by feedback, I mean new knowledge. And from that new knowledge, you can make better decisions to go forward in the future. I wanted to talk about what I consider to be the biggest myth or misconception about learning photography and improving at photography. So I wrote a recent blog post on my website about this and you guys can go, I'll leave the link below. It's just called The Secret to Success for Creators. And all I talk about in this blog post is that when you start out in photography or you're at any skill level in photography, you're sitting at your current spot and you're looking out at all these people that might inspire you. Maybe they're, you like their images or their style or what they're up to. And you're like, I wish I could be like that. So you start to make all these changes in your life and learn new skills, buy new gear, whatever else you think will help you get to this position. And then you start to realize going down that path that you look at your images and they're not getting any better. You look at everything you're doing and you're like, 
man, that guy's so far ahead of me. There's no way that I'll ever get there. And it just feels so bad in your mind. You're looking at your shots and you're like, man, my shots are crap. And there's just this constant mental cycle and struggle of bad thoughts about your images. And then once in a while you get an image and you're like, yes, that's awesome. I finally got one. I'm getting closer to that person. And then you cycle back into the same mental trap of my images look like crap. So I think this is pretty normal. I go through it all the time and I've gone through it at every stage of learning. And I still think my images look really bad. Whether other people like them or not, doesn't really matter to me. It's more of a game that I play with myself. But I think the big misconception is, is that one day that this mental struggle of creating will go away. But if you think about it, when you're creating stuff, you're creating by itself. I mean, creating means to make something that doesn't exist yet. So it's not going to be a clear and refined path where you can just go step by step by step through the hoops and get somewhere like the person you wanna see or you wanna create art like them. So it's always gonna be this mental struggle. And I think the best creators are the people that are able to see that and that they are able to work every day on what they care about consistently and not stop. And most importantly, not listen to all the bad thoughts and the bad ideas in their mind that are telling them their current work's horrible, their current stuff's horrible. They'll never get to where they wanna go because all those negative thoughts are gonna be there for everyone but if you have the motivation, and by motivation, I don't mean this woo-woo thing that just comes in. And it's like, I'm motivated today. By motivation, I mean you have a goal, you have a plan, and you just get up and work on that plan every single day. That's how you get to where you want to go. Don't listen to the thoughts on the way there. But I think for some reason, there's a lot of bad advice around creativity that it's going to feel good all the time and that it's going to be a great thing all the time. Well, a lot of it's really not enjoyable. A lot of it doesn't feel good. It makes you feel bad about yourself. But I think the opposite direction or route to take is not doing it at all. And that can lead to much worse issues because your whole life you'll be questioning and looking at all these other people that are doing it. And you'll be saying to yourself, I could do that, but I'm not doing it. I could do that, but I'm not doing it. And for me, that would just cause a lot of self-doubt and depression, to tell you the truth. If I did that all the time and I didn't, have an idea and then go after it and then just do it every single day, I would doubt myself to the point that I would get depressed. So the reason that I create all the time is so I'm constantly pushing my mind into places where it is uncomfortable and it feels bad about itself and it's not sure what to do. Because when your mind reaches areas like that, you want to just reach them for a little bit, push yourself and then go back to what's comfortable with some new knowledge about what that feels like. Once you're back to where you're comfortable, set a new goal and go back at it again. And you're constantly going back and forth with these mental struggles until you can push your work forward that way. And slowly, year after year after year, it gets better and better. So I think I'm gonna do a video in the future looking at my old images. I've been taking photos for 13 years now, and I still don't think my images are good. I think they're better than they used to be. So I know I'm on the right trend line, right? They're getting better. And if you can say that you're on the right trend line, just because you're not to the so-called destination you have in mind, ah, one of my lights died, I've been talking for so long. But just because you're not to the destination you have in mind, just remember that destination is gonna shift as soon as you get there. So it's more about the trend line of getting better. And even if you're having mental agony, just look at it and be like, dude, why are you so upset about yourself? Just keep creating, it's enjoyable, get better learn stuff, make yourself better. And this is just me talking to myself, right? This is the kind of stuff I say to myself all the time when I feel bad in my mind. But I think anybody that is a prolific creator and constantly puts out work understands this to a point. They know a lot of days they don't feel like showing up and doing it. And they know a lot of days that they're gonna feel like crap about themselves, but they do it anyway. So the myth about photography is that you're just suddenly gonna learn it with some tip or trick you get on YouTube. But realistically, the best way to learn it is to have some people ahead of you you can trust that will give you information. But don't necessarily think that if I give you a step-by-step -step process, it's always going to work for you. Sure, it works for me, but I'm always going to be testing it and trying to make it better. So if you saw me do it two years ago, I can guarantee you things I did two years ago, I'm not doing now. I might do a slight variation of them, but always do things in your own way where you're questioning yourself. You're saying, there's no way I'm always right. You're always having feedback from your failures and you're always assuming 
This is just me talking to myself. I'm not telling you to do it. You can do whatever you want. Um, you're always assuming that you're not going to feel the best while you're creating. I just think there's too much of an emphasis on happiness and feeling good all the time. And what makes me feel good is just constantly pushing on myself and saying, okay, you're comfortable here. It's time to push it to the next level. You're comfortable here. It's time to push it to the next level. Because for me, that's interesting. And I just feel alive and I feel good when I do that. That's why I like backpacking. That's why I like landscape photography, because there's always more stuff to learn. And when I get to the spot that I thought was good, maybe five years ago, I'm like, that's not where I want to be. Let's keep pushing it because all these new pathways and stuff open up. So check out that blog post, guys. I think it will help you out a lot. It just delves into all the misconceptions and failures that I've had over time. And that's where I get all this stuff from. I just look at the problems I have and have had and all the failures I've had and the things that I've been successful at once in a while. And I try to speak them clearly back to you guys so you can maybe sidestep some of those things and it'll save you some time. But it's still going to be a lot of mental anguish, a lot of self-doubt, and you'll probably beat yourself up mentally. But just try to step back from it and be like, okay, I just feel like crap about my work today. Big deal. Let's get after it again tomorrow. So I'll leave you guys with that. I know it was a long video today. Let me know below the video if you liked it. Oh, the other thing. I can now see who are subscribers when they comment. And I noticed most of you guys comment, but you don't subscribe to my channel, which is fine. But if you want to see these videos all the time, when I put up new ones, just hit the subscribe button and the bell, and then they'll pop up. And I'm going to, for now on, just answer questions from people that subscribe because I can see who's subscribed. And that way they will actually get the answer because if I answer somebody's question on these Q&A that doesn't subscribe, the chance of them seeing the answer is pretty small. So I want them to get that answer. So I'll answer subscriber questions um, from now on. So if you guys like what I'm putting out, just hit the subscribe button. I never ask you guys, but I might as well from now on because I know some of you want to see these videos, but you never hit it. So it's not your fault. I don't hit the subscribe button either enough. I should subscribe to more people too. So just throwing that out there. See you guys. I'll see you on Wednesday.